Okay. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, this is part three of the gas law lecture. I told you it was going to be a long one. Okay, so now we're going to look at the relationship between temperature and volume, or Charles's law. All matter expands when it's heated, but gases are special in that the degree of expansion is independent of their composition. The French scientists Jacques Charles and Joseph Gay-Lussac independently found that if the pressure is held constant, the volume of any gas changes by the same fractional amount, or 1 over 273 of its value, for each degree Celsius change in temperature. The volume of a gas confined against a constant pressure is directly proportional to the absolute temperature. In other words, it's a straight line. So you can see the graphical expression of the law of Charles and Gay-Lussac um, seen on this plot. So the straight line plot show that the ratio of volume over temperature is a constant at any given pressure. So we can express the law algebraically as V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. The extrapolation of Charles's law is the first evidence of special significance of the temperature of absolute zero. The lower the pressure, the greater the volume, which is Boyle's law. So at low pressure, the fraction V over 273 will have a larger value. You might say that the gas must contract faster to reach zero volume when its starting volume is larger. So let's take a look at one of the problems for Charles's law. Okay, so we've got the air pressure of a car tire is 30 PSI at 10 degrees Celsius. What will be its pressure after the driving has raised its temperature to 45 degrees Celsius? Okay, so we know that um, P1 times T1 equals P2 times T2. So what we do is we take P2, we do this algebraically, oh I'm sorry, P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. So what we do is we take P2, we isolate that, and we get P1 times T2 divided by T1. And remember, we have to do this in Kelvin. It is vitally important that you do it in Kelvin. So when we plug this in, our P2 equals 30 PSI times 318 Kelvin divided by 283 Kelvin, because that's 10 degrees Celsius. So our new pressure is going to give us 33.7 PSI. And I'm sorry you have to deal with my horrible writing. In relation between the temperature of the gas and its volume has long been known. In 1702, Guillaume Amontant, who is better known for his early studies of friction, devised a thermometer that related the temperature to the volume of a gas. Robert Boyle had observed this inverse relationship in 1662, but the lack of any uniform temperature scale at the time, remember there were 35 of them at the time, prevented them from establishing a relationship that we presently understand it. Jacques Charles discovered that the law that is named for him in the 1780s, but did not publish his work. John Dalton published a form of the law in 1801, but the first thorough published presentation was made by Gay-Lussac in 1802 who acknowledged Charles's earlier studies. The buoyancy that lifts a hot air balloon into the sky depends on the difference between the density, mass over volume, of the air entrapped within the balloon's envelope compared to that of the air surrounding it. When a balloon on the ground is being prepared for flight, it is partially inflated by an external fan and possesses no buoyancy at all. Once the propane burners are started, the air begins to expand according to Charles's law, because it's temperature changing. After the warmed air is completely inflated the balloon, further expansion simply forces the air, excess air out of the balloon, leaving the weight of the diminished mass of air inside the envelope smaller than that of the greater mass of the cooler air that the balloon displaces. 
Jacques Charles collaborated with the Montgolfier brothers, whose hot air balloon made the world's first man balloon flight in June of 1783. Ten days later, Charles himself co-piloted the first hydrogen-filled balloon, and Gay-Lussac, had a special interest in the composition of the atmosphere, also saw the potential of the hot air balloon, and in 1804, he ascended to a then record height of 6.4 kilometers. Really, really, really freaking high. In the same 1808 article in which Gay-Lussac published his observations on the thermal expansion of gases, he pointed out that when two gases react, they do so in volume ratios that can always be expressed as small whole numbers. This came to be known as the law of combining volumes. The small whole numbers are, of course, the same ones that describe the combining weights of elements to form simple compounds as described in the lesson dealing when we talked about um, finding the empirical formulas. The Italian scientist Amedio Avogadro drew the crucial conclusion that these volume ratios must be related to the relative numbers of molecules that react in the famous even principle, which means that equal volumes of gases measured at the same temperature and pressure contain equal numbers of molecules. Avogadro's law predicts directly proportional relations between the number of moles of a gas and its volume. This relationship, originally known as Avogadro's hypothesis, was crucial in establishing the formulas of simple molecules at the time, around 1811. When the distinction between atoms and molecules was not clearly understood, in particular the existence of diatomic molecules of elements such as hydrogen, oxygen, and chlorine, was not recognized until the results of the combining volume experiments, such as those depict, uh, depicted, could be in, interpreted in terms of the even principle. So all of these guys' work became combined into the ideal gas equation. If the variables P, V, T, and N, which is the number of moles, have known values, then a gas is said to be, be in a definite state, meaning that all other physical properties of the gas are also defined. The relation between these state variables is known as the equation of state by combining the expression of Boyle's, Charles, and Avogadro's laws. So you can write the very important ideal gas equation of state where the proportionality constant R is known as the gas constant. This is one of the few equations you have to commit to memory in chemistry. So you should also know the common value and units of R. An ideal gas is defined as a hypothetical substance that obeys the ideal gas equation of state. Take note of the word hypothetical, though. No real gas whose molecules occupy space and interact with each other can behave in a truly ideal manner. A pressure of only one atmosphere is sufficiently close to zero to make this relation useful for most gases at this pressure, however. So when in doubt, assume one atmosphere of pressure. The ideal gas equation is really the only one you need to know for chemistry. So let's take a look at a problem for it. A biscuit made with baking powder has a volume of 20 mils of which one-fourth consists of empty space created by gas bubbles produced when the baking powder decomposed to carbon dioxide. What weight of sodium bicarbonate was present in the baking powder in the biscuit? Assume that the gas reached its final uh, volume during the baking process. So what you do is you use the ideal gas equation to find the number of moles of carbon dioxide gas. This will be the same as the number of moles of sodium bicarbonate, which is 84 grams per mole. So you have 9.1 times 10 to the negative 6 moles times 84 grams per mole. And that's going to give you 0 0.0076 grams. Sorry. The standard temperature and pressure is... 273 degrees Kelvin and one atmosphere. At standard temperature and pressure, one mole of a gas occupies 22.4 liters. So what is the volume of 4.59 moles of carbon dioxide gas at standard temperature and pressure? Notice we don't care about the molecular weight of carbon dioxide here. We only care about the number of moles. So we have 4.59 moles 
And remember at STP, it is one atmosphere of pressure and it's uh, zero degrees Celsius. So it's not a factor. So we know that it's 22.4 liters per mole because all the other factors are no longer an issue. So we get rid of that and that gives us 102.8 liters. Okay, this concludes the gas equations, but I want you to really, really, really make sure that you practice this material. Okay, have a great day, and I hope that you uh, practice this and see me on office hours if you have questions. Thanks.